Thank you. Um, today I will talk about some concepts about what to do when, when you have a phage genome or phage genes which doesn't match anything. It doesn't, these are not similar to anything. So how do you a, first recognize something you haven't seen before? How can I start categorizing something and how can I then compare it? So, that does not, the slide folder does not work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't work on the computer either. Can I get some support, please? <laughs> I can't forward slides. Oh no, something. Okay, for people coming from the bacterial field, they get some kind of some surprises. So when you start sequencing a bacterial genome and you wanted to annotate it, you had to identify the, the genes. Then for typical bacterial genome, you get a lot of genes where you can recognize some fun function, get some hint what genes do. So the green ones, green genes are the ones where you can get some kind of homologs and get an idea what the genes are doing. And the red ones are the ones with hypothetical proteins. We, we don't know anything. Here for salmonella, it's 5%. Other uh, bacteria is between 15 and 30 percent unknown. Then first surprise get when you get the first uh, bacteria, a uh, phage genome, a jump of genome, and then annotate, and suddenly almost everything is just red. You don't only get hypothetical proteins. You have no idea what they're doing. They're not matching anything. You start looking further into it and look at genes, compare genes, compare breath sac bacterial genes from 10,000 genomes, all genes versus everything. You see that there, there's a high degree of similarity. If you do the same thing for phage genes, you see directly, okay, this is where the problem is. We have very little similar similarity, most between closely related genomes. Okay, then that's okay. Let's just focus on one particular bacterial host and look at all the all the bacteria, the phages attacking it. Surely there has to be some kind of uh, combined collected. Uh, proteins which are common there. Second surprise, Salmonella shares more genes with us humans than two of these different phage groups. So the, the cataphages and the SPFM phages don't share anything, no DNA, no protein function. So on this, this leads to some challenges because most of our tools are based on sequence similarity. Finding something in databases, comparing, aligning, it is your lineup sequences and get some idea about how related they are. If you're in relation, then, then you have problems. So we have a consortium called the Phage Compass. It's us at University of Copenhagen, it's Marta, Andy from Leicester University, it's Ames University in Malaysia, and University of Los Andes in Colombia. And we have of years developed three concepts about how to sidestep these challenges. We're using feature-based machine learning to actually start recognizing the unrecognizable. We are looking to plant ecology, as Marta already told about, to be able to categorize phage genomes, phages into, into types. And then we're using social network analytics to actually be able to compare different phage genomes. We're starting with the machine learning. So we, said we, we are using feature-based machine learning, so moving from sequence space into feature space. And what does that mean? I give a short example about cats and dogs. Just imagine you want to, you have a lot of pictures of cats and dogs. You want to different, you want to find features which differentiate between a cat, a picture of a cat, a picture of a dog. You could start with, yeah, let's look at shape of ears. Shape of ears is a, is a nice feature. It can separate a little bit, but you, you see that on small dogs, have also like a cat shape. Yes, so a shape of ears can separate a little bit. It's a feature, but not a particularly good feature. We can look at others, like the length of the tongue. Um, some dogs have a short tongue, so it's not a super good feature either. You can look at fur patterns, color of the eye, etc., etc. a lot of features. So none of these features is strong, can separate cats and dogs. But together, if you move, use them together, then you actually start getting a quite good separator. And this is exactly what we're doing um, we started with how can we tell phage DNA from bacterial DNA? We look at features like gene lengths. You know already that heard several times today and yesterday 
bacterial uh, phage genes tend to be slightly shorter than bacterial genes, but just that is not enough. The intergenic regions can also be used. We can look at GC content, amelicity, amino acid composition, flexibility, are there any kind of DNA modifications, uh, protein modifications, all that are different features, um, which together are much, much stronger to actually separate between phage DNA and bacterial DNA. DNA. So what you have here is <coughs> we developed three different uh, programs, which takes a lot of different features on the protein base, and we are calculating 2,000 different features. And then, for example, here we're running it over bacterial genome. All different colors, these are kind of features, and you see directly there are some spikes. Here. And here, in this case, these spikes are prophages. So you can only see without any kind of direct training, you can see from this in the feature space that there is something which you, not, which you cannot really see in the, in the DNA space directly. So just moving from sequence features to, to protein features is already giving us a, um, a good argument, a, a good tool to start separating just or, or recognizing. So why does that work? So the idea is that when, when you calculate protein features, a protein never works alone. A protein works with something else, with the environment, with the machinery. So the, the, the sequence can change a lot, but the protein, the different features like is phosphorylated or not, that is harder to change. So this is one way of how we can go and just yeah, recognize and recognize them. Now <coughs> we can go to how can we categorize page genomes when we not even can compare, as a, when there is no similarity. So Marta already hinted today that we <coughs> looked in uh, phage ecology strategies. Um, it's brought from the, from the plant uh, ecology. So they have the, the Grimes, the triangle, then we can uh, categorize plants and then we also phages by putting on in this kind of triangle in, in a triangle of coordinates. So in, in between stress tolerating organisms, comp competing organisms and rural world. So this is based on here yeah, on the on, on the transcriptional phases of uh, of uh, a phage. So in the transcription, you get the first thing, the early genes, then the middle genes, and the late genes. You know, here with Streptococcus, and you see there's a different proportion. And generally, early genes are bring, uh, bring interactions with the host system. The middle genes most times are part of phage replication whereas the late genes are the structural genes in wild morphogenesis, which can be directly correlated with the, the, the C, S, and R part of triangle, the goals for maintenance and regeneration. So if we look at that for different phages, you can see some phages like D5 doesn't have middle genes, puts all its resources indexed in, in, the, in the first part, in the early genes, in the growth, so we can just use these as coordinates in the ecological triangle and we get different types. So the P5 would be here in the competitor region. There's the sun phage. Here is uh, and the stress tolerating and so on. The nice part here is, so if you look at the genes, most of them are, we don't even know the function. So the, the whole thing is independent on gene annotation or gene function. We just make the uh, just do the transcriptomic experiment. You get the number early middle late genes and we can start at least to categorize and 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 start comparing different phages the other good in stress environment like almost all cyanophages are here in the in this restorating part so that is how we can without any kind of similarity requirement can start finding phage types and categorize them third part is we're using we can use social network graphs so you can start comparing genomes. So most of you have already encountered social network graphs from Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. You know, if you get book recommendations, movie recommendations, music recommendations, it's the, the build graphs of all the, of the data from the people, put all the metadata on it, like political review, interaction with others, um, what they like, the geography, and so on. And from that, they can using social network analysis, they can make quite good recommendations of what, what you want to shop next time or books. 
let's, we can do similar things with phage genomes. We can put phage genomes in networks and we can put metadata also on it. Everything from the geography, what kind of phage family is, taxonomy, the lifestyle, then also just features about if it has tRNAs or polymerases, all the different things which uh, are important for the niche or for the, the ecological strategies. So this is what also Marta hinted you, on the day and you did see several times this kind of what we call the phage clouds. We've developed it previously. Phage clouds is a network graph of phage genomes and most time we're using host specific ones. So here we see bacteria salmonella and all uh, 960 phages, phage genomes available and and they're correlated by how, uh, how similar they are. So close, uh, close related, the related ones, all clustered together in kind of subgraphs. Um, each circle is one phage genome. We have uh, big ones, jumbo phages. We have small ones with phi x, the very tiny ones here. And yeah, size and then size of proportional to the genome size. Color is by a taxonomy. And you can see the different groups and there's, as I said before, there's, there's, there's no similarity. There's nothing which connects these, these two uh, the other. So now we can put metadata on it. Are they having RNA polymerases? Only two groups have these. Are they having tRNAs? Also kind of important for ecological strategy. But are they having phosphatases? Anything else we want to project onto it. After that, we can start running social network analysis and try to see if we can put things in context. So if you look at eight different phage clouds from different bacteria, so here we, again, we start with salmonella, which we see before, we have Krebsiella, down here it's E. coli, Salmonas, Bacillium stuff, Streptococcus, Mycobacterium. You see there are some similarities and it looks completely different. The first thing we can see directly, which we can transfer from one cloud, because we, well, salmonella cloud is the one we have started most, is, that lytic uh, lysogenic phages, separate phages, are quite easy to spot. So first they're easy because they have this green circle around. This is our, our, our predictor, have been colored them. But what you can see is all lysogenic clouds are quite irregular. They're kind of more, slightly more chaotic. Whereas strictly lytic phages are, they form these really nice circular clouds. So we can already, just by, from starting from some other phages, uh, uh, learning this, can apply that directly to others. We have the freedom. Most of them are lysogenic, streptococcus also. So, so we can start that. Then with all the metadata on it, we can start running um, network analysis and trying to so be, this is the part we have, we, we have started collecting data and we are starting now to build. So there are no results yet on this. So, but that means we can, hopefully we can start comparing without any kind of uh, sequence in matter because, because whatever is in this cloud, there is most likely no sequence in matter to, this, to just maybe with some small ones from single proteins, but not from the whole genomes. So next part, now I have to switch to a white background because protein structure is, doesn't really not look good on black background. So several people today and also yesterday have already mentioned alpha fold which and Matt also showed it, so we really love it. So we, <coughs> we have been uh, running on a supercomputer. So we have generated up to today 20,000 different uh, phage protein structures. And most of them are Martha's Clostridium and Salmonella phages. This is what we call the structure room for one Clostridium phage. Um, you can see here this protein is what Martha showed before, the tail fiber protein. And I just want to check, tell you this. So that was the first one we tried. So, so I, I love they, they, they created the, the tracer structure of, in a time span of four years. Then Alpha Fold came and we tried to predict it from the sequence and it's brilliant. So there's it's a, such an accurate prediction. So that gave us actually the hope that yes, Alpha Fold is actually quite good in the phage space. So let's run it everywhere. So we created, a lot of different uh, structure roms, a lot of different um, phage genes and protein, proteomes. Um, 
example, we can directly see this, uh, we can see the, the late proteins versus the structure protein. We can differentiate between the early proteins, early genes. So we created this phi alpha structure database, and now we can really start looking at transfer gene annotation for, for things we haven't been able to before. So let's say we, we have a, a hypothetical protein, we get, we get a sequence, it doesn't match anything. But we're really curious, what could it be? So we predict the alpha fold, the protein structure, then we use the structure and start uh, aligning a stru structure to other structures in our database in, in, in the genome. And we get a quite a good hit. It's not a perfect hit, there are some differences, but most people agree that it's most likely the same protein. So what is it? It's a known major capsule protein. But there's, not, there's no sequence similarity, nothing in between. But it's within uh, Clostridium of ages. So with that, we can build on the pipeline. After blasting everything and we get still uh, proteins with no, no hits, then we can actually start moving into uh, alpha fold and, and, and structure space and try to hit there. It's fun, it's nice, takes ages. <laughs> alpha fold is a cool thing, but it's not fun. So um, that, this is uh, the concept we, we tried to tell us about. We can, we can start making as recognized things by using specific type of machine learning, biological feature space. We can start categorizing by looking at um, the transcription phases and putting pages into page types. And we can start comparing, hopefully, when we get the, all the, 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 the network graphs and comparison up and running. And here is just an yeah, acknowledgement of people who have been part of that and the links to the all different predictors and online tools. With that, I thank you for your attention and can answer some questions. Hi, thank you for that. It was a really nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, when you were talking about the phage clouds, um, did you say that all of the lysogenic phages are, are grouped together? Um, and I was just wondering yeah. why no. that was and if no, you could explain no, that not, a bit more. Not that they're grouped together, it's that we can easily see the difference between um, phages, which are <coughs> lithic, have a much more clearer, they, they much clearer uh, circular clouds than lysogenic phages, which are kind of created most of the time maybe because they can snatch part of the genome and there's, there's more difference between. So, all the clouds which are kind of not circular, chaotic, like these ones, they are most likely temperate. It's not, it's, again, it's not perfect, but it's, 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 a, it's a good start. You can see. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Tempton from University of Exeter. So one question I have is, identifying the start and stop of the coding regions of phage genes is not an exact science. If you run a genome through Prodigal, you'll get a different set of coding regions than anything else. How do you cope with that in your tools? Do you just accept that there are problems with all tools and that you just use the same one for all of yes. them? And does that translate into AlphaFold potentially missing some structure in the end because you've actually got the, the start or stop wrong? Um, that we, okay, we start with, yes, we, we, we know there's a problem. <laughs> um, and also, yes, we just using Freudschild and everything to speed, uh, because we, we, we tried all the concerns. It, it was not really worth the, the, the engagement on with a uh, more sophisticated, except, of course, when you have um, genomes, like the LAC genomes, where you have different codes, where actually then Freudschild will just give you bunch of very small proteins which are should be stitched together. In that case, since we need to be very, very careful. And that we also saw that we had the first alpha fold prediction of that was just bollocks, was not really because it was just small pieces. Um, but yes, we need to look at actually what I think is that the the, at the end is it does not affect I was somebody has told me this does not affect the structure that strongly. I'm not completely convinced in that so we need to run 
Gracias, Juan Carlos. Okay, cool, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm especially interested in your last slide about how an hypothetical protein can become something known once you look at the structure. Mm -hmm. Do you think that using AlphaFold we can reduce the amount of hypothetical proteins that we find in phage genomes just because maybe the structure of these proteins was maintained over time while the sequence changed because it's not really important? Let us try to find out. And we we think that within, at least within a, in a group in the same host, for example, here in the Clostridiums, we, we can see that we see the same structures and but uh, different sequences. Why? Diversity or evolution of backwards, don't really exactly know. Um, we also see examples where from the Clostridium salmonella to something completely different. You, you, you can also go to a thing like PDB and there are a lot of page uh, proteins, the structure. So we can see matches. But not, we haven't found extremely high, uh, strong matches like this um, between uh, very, very different hosts. But then we have, we have just touched uh, and then start looking into it. Okay, thanks. Oh, hi. Uh, yes, a very interesting talk. So can you finally tell us if there is a correlation between, well, there has to be a correlation between the genome and the family, like is either Cifoviridae or Meoviridae, uh, can we stop doing EM or, or do we still have to do EM? We love EM. <laughs> of course, you should continue. No, we, we, can, we can help uh, the, the clouds are separating that, that, that nicely. Uh, hopefully, with more output photos, we actually can, can try to understand the, the diversity and why it, it changed, why the sequence just went. Where it went in what direction? So. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, I'm La, I'm Ling. I'm from Copenhagen Universities. I'm well. I'm curious about the line work on that slides that the previous the questions. I I want to uh, I want to ask about. Um, since um, different uh, phage uh, can infect the similar uh, host bacterial and the, their um, genome uh, after annotation, they can cluster, uh, cluster in together. So what kind of research questions we can propose based on the lab work? I'm not completely sure that I understood. Um, so, so which slide we're talking about? Uh, uh, previous one, the line work. The la no, uh, uh, yeah, this one. Okay, okay. So uh, we, we can see that uh, there are, as for the similar and based on this cluster, so we can see there, there are a lot of clustering within this bacteria, right? I mean, th this picture. So what, what kind of questions we can ask? Yeah, oh, that's actually, actually I forgot something to tell here. <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah, the major point. Um, I forgot to tell about the phage cocktails. So if you look at the salmonella cloud, you can see that some of the, the, the genomes are colored yellow. All of these are uh, phages, Staphylomatis lab, which we tried in phage cocktails. And there's a, uh, there's a combination of, the, of these three uh, phages which gives a very strong, a good cocktail against the targeting uh, salmonella. So what we want you to do is, can we find, by putting the metadata on it, can we, can we transfer that information that a phage cocktail A, you need one big tumor phage which maybe have, has an uh, RNA polymerases for some kind of a clodular part combined with a much smaller phage which maybe can go is faster, can go in first, can, can transfer that information to a completely different organism where there's no sequence memory, but maybe we can actually build cocktails. We can in, uh, learn making phage cocktails by seeing what is important from ecological review, uh, from what the phage can do, what phages you need to combine into a uh, completely different host. So it's about the phage selection, right? I mean, yes. okay. Yes, that's, Thank you that's, so much. In the end, that's what we want to do. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. 
the interest of time now, we should uh, close there. But um, thank you very much, Thomas, for a great talk.